I am J.V. Bryan, the President and Chief Investment Officer of J.V. Bryan Financial Group, a registered investment advisory firm created to help empower the Black community within deteriorating the wealth gap and making this world a better place for everyone. Yes, indeed because that's how we are instructed. Everybody's life has a purpose. Everybody is here, put here to make this world a better place. Not just some of us, all of us were born with a purpose, an agenda, and your agenda may be just to make sure that someone else accomplishes what they're put here to do. And Lord, don't, don't, don't count yourself out because the, I mean, everybody cannot be a chief. We need some good Indians. And the best chief is the strong Indian. It's amazing how uh, our world is designed that it does not appreciate those who actually make it all happen. It's not the people that you see all the time that make it possible. My Afroeconomics team makes it possible for you to remember that, hey, teamwork, makes the dream work. And I would be kidding myself if I thought that this was possible without your support. Yes, I need your support, Ethel. I need your support, Monica. I need your support, Gary. I need your support, Ronald. I need your support, Mike. I need your support, George. I need your support, Yule. Yes, artists, I need your support because we are going to destroy poverty. Afroeconomics has established an anti-poverty agenda. Yes, indeed. And I think that this is one of the most important things that I can ever do as far as developing wealth within the Black community. And because as a owner of a registered investment advisory firm, I think that it's easy to get caught up on only serving those who are on top. But I know, and that's why it was about last year this time, where I said that I have to have an Afroeconomics membership that allows everyone to participate in this financial empowerment. When we have our members meetings on any time, but every Friday, or if we don't have it on Friday, we'll have it on Saturday. When we have our members meetings, it's open to every member. When we have these Wednesday night sessions, it's open to the entire public. But that is because I, I don't want to be um, a catalyst of continuing something that has already happened to us. A lot of people are not financially stable or are live, so a lot of people are living in poverty because of the information that has not been shared with them. That's the scariest part of it. Nobody really wants to accept responsibility that maybe they actually contributed to the lack of financial empowerment of someone else. You don't have to give anybody any money, but we certainly can be sharing knowledge with everyone that we run into. I believe that we have a responsibility sharing in order to do that, right? I believe that. That's why the No Excuses membership of Afroeconomics exists, because I don't want you to have an excuse. So as this political, uh, this political experience is like being dumped upon us, and I was looking at the debate briefly um, the other night. It was like, I don't know, one or two. It could have been last night. And they were talking, and you heard poverty come up a little bit um, with one or two, but it's not a major um, aspect of their uh, of of the race. Like they're not, it, they don't really feel like it. Poverty has to be addressed because, look, being and I'm gonna say this sarcastically, I guess because it only impacts 40 million Americans, according to the stats. 40 million people in the U.S. are living, you know, in poverty or below. So, you know, the, the America has decided, like, it is the one that has defined what poverty is. 
you know? So, and then, and then when I look at, there's this study, I'm going to tell you about this. Um, there's debt.org. I'm also going to give you, I'm going to give you this. Um, the USA Today did a story on the progress in fighting poverty in America. Um, and it says the fighting poverty in America has slowed down despite recent economic recovery. So even though the economy is doing well, like there's not, according to their numbers, there's just as many um, poor people, but there's not dramatically more. So they don't feel like it's a huge problem because there's not a lot more people in poverty. But we know that it's still a seriously bad problem. And then this, the U.S. Census Bureau says that there is um, a longstanding official poverty measure was created in 1963. Um, and they used this measure that was developed in 1963 to determine the eligibility of people for 82 federal programs. Right? I mean, so the, the problem is that 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 right there shows that there's absolutely nothing really like your television set from 1963 still doesn't work so why would we think that the poverty measures on how we decide on poverty is still significant and you're basing it on how you did it from 1963 you know basing it on income levels when there's so many different Things like, just like, you know, where we have a federal minimum wage. So we have a federal minimum wage that they decided that they're not going to adjust the federal minimum wage by inflation, even though they adjust Social Security by inflation. And I guess that that could be why we have less people over 65 that are living in poverty because over 65, generally they're qualifying for at least um, a social security benefit. But the, uh, a person younger doesn't qualify for anything like social security. You know, so they're going to, they're more likely to live in poverty. And who else? Any children that they have will be living in poverty. So I would say that one thing that really has to be on our minds as we choose who we want to vote for moving forward is are we going to update how we look at poverty because unemployment and poverty is disproportionately affecting african americans and that's according to feedingamerica.org it's saying that that the black, the, the black households have significantly lower household incomes than whites. So that makes a black family twice as likely to face hunger and a black child to be much more likely to be hungry. It says 10 counties in the United States have the highest food insecurity rates in the nation. And 60% of those counties are made up of a majority of black people. So race and are at least 60% African American, those 10 counties. Seven of the 10 counties are located in Mississippi. Wow. Poverty rates for black people in 2017 was more than twice that of white people. And 10% of black people live in deep poverty. 10%. Mm. Wow. Wow. So the deep poverty means that they have less than 50% of the um, federal poverty threshold. So if the single person making less than 15,000, and so we have 10% of us that would be doing even 50%, making even less, making even half of that. Or family of four with 25,000, and then it would be, but a family of four with, you know, 10, 12,000. So, wow, 10% of black people living in deep poverty. You know, this is, this is real. So let's, let's just, you know, be before I want to make sure that, that I address 
the um okay <laughs> i want to make sure like if y'all say something to me please feel free to make your comments i will get them as soon as i can but when i go to my notes it's hard i can't see it at the exact same time i appreciate you all we have a great participation and the important part of it is is that none of you are living in poverty but we have to remember and I don't know how much you've been through in life, but I've been through a lot as a entrepreneur, single parent, you know, and I know how easy it is for life to change. And as a financial advisor, I've seen things happen so quickly in life. I got an email from an entrepreneur and she was just telling me about a family situation that was so stressful to her husband that it made him sick. And then he was hospitalized. And they came from a year ago being at top of their game to her having to worry about him so much and make sure that he didn't die. Like he was that sick, her husband, that their income changed so drastically that she's trying to figure out how to hold on to everything while he recovers. So we have to realize that no matter where you are right now, how easy it is for everything to change on you. And that's why we have to be, I'm not asking for sympathy for our people living in poverty, but I'm talking about empathy. That so we should think about like, what, what if that were me? Or my, what family members do I have that, that can be empowered through some of these suggestions that we're going to talk about tonight? So let, let's just look at these. And I'll just put down some points. First of all, I don't understand how anybody can't take advantage of a free membership to Afroeconomics that's designed to educate. It does not focus on selling any product. It's not talking to anybody. Now, of course, I want you to invest with me. Of course, I want everybody to be building up at work and have a lump sum and one day take that lump sum and invest that lump sum with me and me help you and we build your future together. Of course, that's what I want. But I can't get you there unless I make sure that I increase the number of financially healthy people in our community. So it's mutually beneficial for me and you and everyone you know for them to get into an environment that is about educating and empowering them financially everyone should have at minimum a free membership to afroeconomics also just because of the consumer advocacy part of it of uh, what something goes down again that impacts our community as drastically we need to have a group that can voice that we have been exploited and this is how this has happened and how it has impacted our wealth like the mortgage crisis that we went through and had nothing to back us up a second point we have to bring the information we all need to know what poverty looks like what poverty is what poverty feels like i mean it looks just like most of us just missing a couple of paychecks. That's what poverty looks like. We have to realize that we have to build on each other and develop a mind, a village mindset, that we have to help one another develop a better mindset. The next time somebody asks you about borrowing money, you know, we need to think about what can you invest in their mind to make sure that you're not handicapping them and you're helping them build their life? Uh, and, I mean, and I had a client, one of them that are participating tonight, that they had a family member that they were helping through a crisis and they told them, you should call J.B. Ryan. Now, the sad part is they never joined. They never did the free membership. They just benefited from having that family member that told them to talk to me and I helped them because of the other member and because I'm committed to our community. But they cut themselves short because it's like going to the gym, getting that free training with the trainer and you do that one time and then you go right back and sit in front of the television and you never go back into the gym again. You know, 
You have, it has to be a part of your life. That's why I do this each week. That's why, I mean, if you went back, those of you who have been doing this with me for over a year, many of you have, and I have a record of it. I know you have, that have been checking in, doing these Wednesday nights or doing the Friday morning consistently, just like a muscle in your arm, you are financially stronger because of that. So the third point is, that we have to create, you know, we're talking about our anti-poverty agenda. First was taking advantage of free membership. Second is bringing the, and, and, and then it, why you're not, because I don't think that anybody should ever be in poverty. You're making money. You should be taking advantage of the real financial planning strategies, of course. And the second point is bringing the information, getting the village mindset set, and pushing that on to every family member that you have, especially those who you see as financially challenged, help them change their mind. And then the third point is we have to create businesses that create jobs and help build dreams. The more businesses that we have, the reduction in poverty will be in direct relation. Now we're talking about the future. We're talking about what we have to do. I'm not talking about like what will help us right now, you know, that, but we do, I mean, will help us right now, but it will take a lot of sacrifice right now, but that's how we're going to build our community out of being the ones who are impacted by poverty the most is that we have to have more businesses because people hire people that look like them typically. So if you want to have where we're, where, as you saw, or as I shared with the statistics that we have higher unemployment and we all know that, and we have higher rates of poverty, we know this unfortunately, then we have to create the businesses. We have to go into the Afroeconomic seventh principle of having that entrepreneurial mindset. It will help us. A fourth point is Encourage anybody you can that is in politics, you know, that, that you really feel and believe in that the minimum wage should be indexed with inflation. And that the, the federal minimum wage should seriously be increased. And that, I mean, that if there are so many millions of people that would have been taken out of poverty almost overnight by just raising the inflation, the, by raising the <laughs> minimum wage by inflation. And it's interesting if you look at the um, research and it shows like that you can find where if you adjusted the, um, by the rate of the cost of living inflation rate since the 1960s, then the federal minimum wage would be well over $10 an hour. And they estimate that over 4 million people would instantly be taken out of poverty status just by having that. And there's a lot of people that, you know, will say, well, that's not going to change it a whole lot. Well, for people who are only making $6 an hour, you know, tell them that they would appreciate the raise. A fifth point is that we need to have more members of our community that understand the earned income tax credit. Because there are a lot of people who are not taking advantage of it. So much so that the IRS has said that if you have filed a tax return and you did not claim the earned income tax credit when you filed in 2016, 2017, and 2018, and you think that you will have qualified for it, the IRS is encouraging them to let them know so that they can get their money back. Mm. The earned income tax credit is a tax credit for low and moderate income wage earners. So they can at a maximum, they can get a maximum of 65, over $6,500 back for this year if they do their tax return correctly and take advantage of the earned income tax credit. But we have to learn because it's too many people don't even do a tax return. You know, so this is to encourage us to also um, get back into the workplace, you know, feel more 
confident about working and know that you actually could end up getting back more than you actually even put in and paid into taxes. And you could still get that earned income tax credit back. Mm. So the earned income tax credit doesn't just cut the amount of taxes that you owe, but the, it can also get you a tax refund. So just, just, just remember that to ask. And then if you have um, family members that are struggling and um, they're not, you know, make sure you ask them, are you doing your tax returns? Do you understand the earned income tax credit? If you have family members, especially a family member with a child, and they're not working, you know, encourage them that there's some tax benefit to them to work and look for a job and to, to motivate them to, to get it. And they, that, that, and it will help them over the long term, just getting back at work and working hard and developing your skill is a true way out of poverty. But we gotta get that, you know, we gotta make sure that we're communicating with each other so that we're motivating one another and not discouraging one another. Mm. And then childcare. Now we're talking about the Afroeconomics anti-poverty agenda. Childcare is real. Mm. One year of childcare for an infant costs more on average than one year of tuition at most public colleges. Mm. Than college for, an, oh my goodness. So on average, poor families who pay out of pocket for childcare spend one third of their income just to be able to work. I was sharing that on a television interview um, that I did on CBS earlier this week about this same point. And that's, I wanted this opportunity to continue this discussion in a more detailed and a more specific way of how it's really impacting us. And then for um, federal child care assistance reaches only one in six eligible children. So that means that we're not taking advantage of it. There's people who could be getting these benefits, but they may not even know that they're eligible. So we have to talk to people. We have to reach out. We have to go get the help. Health insurance, a seventh point, health insurance is still an issue. You know, they've got to make affordable health care. And, and they have to consider expanding Medicaid. I mean, these are the type of things that we need to make sure that people that you vote for are talking about, especially if your health insurance is extremely expensive or not affordable for you. You know, expanding Medicaid would mean that um, more than just access to health care, but it would free up the money so that the people could use, people in poverty can use the money that they have to use because they're not qualifying for Medicaid, that they can use it to pay for housing or pay for education, pay for food. Mm. So having good health care coverage is important. So they're saying, oh, we got this affordable health care but affordable health care is not affordable. And you have so many people who used to qualify for Medicaid and now they don't. Unpaid medical bills are the leading cause of bankruptcy. Silliness. So if we get the Medicaid corrected, it will improve our health. It will improve access to health care services. You know, and it will help us you know, live well longer. Mm. And it will cut out that financial strain. Wow. A eighth point is that we need to create more programs for ourselves, right? Create more programs that will empower adults, that will empower youth. Like I did that college prep program um, at the beginning of this year, and I'm doing the Afroeconomics you know, summit in, um, on, in March to celebrate our 25th year. But that's going to be a program for adults and for youth about training and financial empowerment and community development. But we need to have more of that, right? 
We need to have more of that. We need to have more support of that when you have businesses that do these free workshops. You know, you don't see us saying things like, wow, that's nice, JB. You did that. You didn't have to do that. Like, you know, if you're, if you are doing it, just know, nobody is going to give you a pat on the back. You got to do it because you're committed to the community because nobody is going to say, wow, this is wonderful. It just doesn't happen. So you just have to have your own commitment to God that this is what you have to do. And then we just have to do it. But just know that if you do a program, let me know about it and I will support you just like you supported me. I appreciate what you're doing. You know, we can, we can do those things to really help. Uh, my ninth point is we have to become more, after we create these programs, it'll also lead naturally into to nine, becoming more active in our community, volunteering more, donate more into what we believe in. Kids look, look into re-entry programs that you may be able to help with um, people coming out of the prison setting and helping them start businesses or learning how to work and learning um, how to um, work in the workplace or learning technology or do a computer class for re-entry. Do whatever you can do. These are these steps will, I'm telling you, they will reduce, reduce poverty in our community. And my final point is that we must refuse to be broke. Those of us who are in a position that are making money. We have to make a commitment to avoid materialism and to learn to live below our means, to develop the financial stability for our family and our, you know, our community, our family, and making sure that we create a structure for your household so that no one in your family is ever living in poverty. Because mm. we can only help others if we're financially stable first. You know, some, someone asked me and they were like, you know, you do these things, these free programs, but do you do that because now you're in a position to do that? And I was like, I think that, that we all can always say, I'll do something later because I'll wait until I'll be in this position. But I think that no matter what you have, you have something that you can give. You know, you have something, someone that you can help. And it's not going to make television. Look, the revolution will not be televised. You know, see, nobody's right. But we have to do, we have to do all that we can do. And I believe that it does start at home. That you have to first refuse to be broke and that you're going to build up your family unit and you're going to keep it strong so that you can be an example and that you can go out and help more people because you cleaned up your stuff first. Don't get caught up in this world where it's all you where everything is about what it looks like. Let's make sure that it be like <laughs> what it be like, right? Make it real. Share your talents, share your passion with those who are living in poverty as much as possible but make sure that you are strong, that you first refuse to be broke, that you don't focus on the presentation, but you focus on the reality of making sure that you're not broke. Because there's a plenty of people making money and struggling every month because of all the bills. Mm. And to me, that's self-induced, self-induced poverty, but it hurts. It hurts indeed. Um, Miss, he, Miss Hayes said, yes, we all can contribute something at whatever stage. Y'all refuse to be broke. Yes, indeed. Go to refuse, number two, bebroke.com. That's Afro Economics 100%. It'll bring you right back to me. Refuse to be broke.com all day long. Yes, indeed, Gary, all day long. Thank you all so much. This is the Afroeconomics Anti-Poverty Agenda on October 16th, 2019. We're going to build on this. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. This is just something from my heart. 
on things that I feel that I can do. Because sometimes we just feel like you're, you know, you're just living. You feel like you can't do what well, we can do a lot more than what we do. And you're doing more than what you think you're doing. But let's just be more conscious about what we're doing. Oh, thank you, Monica. Thank you. Please share this. I'm going to put it on the, um, go to the YouTube channel so that you can get updates uh, on when I load them up. I'm going to load this up tonight. I really want our Afroeconomics anti-poverty agenda to become real. It would say, say, yep, the revolution will not, will not be televised. Indeed. Thank you, Brandy. Well, Brandy, you encouraged me to keep striving. It, you really do. You didn't have to. You didn't even have to hang out with me tonight, but you did. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, indeed. Good job. Anti poverty. Y'all have a wonderful night. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you so much. JC Jumpers in the house. Thank you. My hope for the best reality show. Oh, that's so powerful. I think if I could see you with your girls on YouTube going through the house, that would be the best reality show. <laughs> they are true sunshine. Using the wire, improving on audio and video. Thank you so much, Maurice, my technical director. All right, artist. Peace and blessings right back at you. You inspire me, young man. Good night now.